Locusts have a pretty bad reputation, known for wreaking havoc all over the world. But locusts are also intriguing and complex creatures, a special species worthy of intense research by scientists around the world. Locusts have been around as long as humans have been around. They're recorded in the Bible, in the Quran, in Chinese history. Locusts, grasshoppers, belong in the insect order Orthoptera. The locust outbreaks can be extreme, and wherever they land, they can cause 80 to 100 percent crop loss. Locusts threaten people's livestock and food. They cover a huge extent of landscapes, including different ecosystems and biomes. They cross boundaries. They cover a lot of different cultures, a lot of different legal systems. And so managing them is really challenging. In 2019, there was a locust outbreak. The outbreak started in Ethiopia and then it migrated to Kenya and then Uganda. When the locust attacked, the food prices went high and then so life became tough for everybody. Children born during plague years in villages impacted by locusts are, are much less likely to even start school. So you have long-term impacts on educational outcomes. So locusts can be devastating for livelihoods, but they are also very fascinating from a biological perspective. They have a special uh, phenotypic plasticity. They can transform based on their environments and they have this sort of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Mr. Hyde switch. The fascinating thing about a locust is it's just a special grasshopper with a secret ability. A lot of times we think of a gene that might make somebody tall or like some genes that might code for someone's eye color. But locusts, they have genes which allow them to change into different morphs during their lifetime, depending on the environmental conditions and whether they're right for them. So they just look and act like a normal grasshopper. And then when the right conditions come, sporadic rain or heavy rainfall in normally dry areas, they respond dramatically and they come out in larger numbers. They sense one another's presence and that changes their neurochemistry, the color of their bodies. They become attracted to one another. And if these conditions persist, then they march in coordinated formations across the landscape and then eventually swarm in unthinkably large clouds. This is a textbook example of phenotypic plasticity. Density affects the phenotype. Same species, but rarer than two different density conditions. There's a locust, there's a locust, gregarious, and solitaries. The only way you can achieve this coloration and then gregarious behavior is by wearing them in high density condition. I have been studying locusts for my entire career, and here I have the luxury of wearing them and can do some ex very exciting experiments. These things will actually march in the lab. If you have a high enough density, you can actually see them march around. It's complicated to predict locust outbreaks, which have these horrible impacts on folks in the locust endemic regions, because once we think we figured something out, then we put that into our prediction models, and then it doesn't always play out in nature the way that we thought it would based on our lab data. So when you see enough surge on the news, there's the tendency to think maybe there could be a simplified solution or we just need a silver bullet, but it's actually highly complex. For other pests, you can manage them like a country or a community can just try and work on it and then they eliminate the problem. But locusts require collaboration, communication between many people across countries, across communities. In Mexico, we have a Central American locust. The closest swarm of the Central American locust to the U.S. border is in Tamaulipas. It is important for us to have a study resources to study, then when it's time for an outbreak, we need to have a system in place to deal with these things. And we should do that globally, but we should also do that in the U.S. We now have the capacity to study them in a very systematic way, in a comparative way. The BPRI is made up of PIs, so principal investigators or researchers at six different institutions across the United States as well as trainees, so students and postdocs that are associated with those labs, all working to tackle this complicated problem that is locusts. 
Within the BPRI, we have a remarkable opportunity to study, for example, within species across levels of organization from molecular to the genome on up to their field ecology and what happens in outbreaks. We can conduct the type of comparative analyses that really haven't been possible to this point. Locusts are actually really great research organism or study organism to study physiology in the lab. So most of the people who have studied locusts in the past 30 years or so were lab-based scientists. But now we are talking about studying locusts in the field, studying locusts in a context where those actually matter to people. And that's novel. It's easy to design an integrative research program on paper. We have learned over time, of course, that implementing that concept can come with many challenges and we've worked to overcome those. Being in BPRI gives me the opportunity to be able to interact with other people, know how they think. We are all trying to solve the same problem, but we also think differently. So we have these tools that help us to see the problem from different perspectives and therefore we're able to come up with something that is more complete. By studying locusts from all of these different angles, we hope to understand not only how we can help people globally that are directly impacted by locusts, but also understand why animals in general are able to shift and change and what kind of parameters are on them.